Hello fellow 72nd pilots, Stretch here. Just picked up DCS Huey and I'm going to check it out with you guys. Now before I get started, I want you all to know I've only been, I uh, only got this sim uh, installed about 45 minutes ago and I've been playing with it a little bit but I'm hardly an expert so um, this is not going to be a very like authoritative, authoritative instruction. Uh, this is more just going to be me probably making mistakes and giving you a sense of how it is. Um, so this is the Huey. As you can see, it's the first DCS sim to have multi-crewed positions. I got a co-pilot to my left, two door gunners at the ready behind me. Um, as you can see, if I move my controls around, the co-pilot's controls move as well. Same with the uh, anti-torque uh, pedals. Uh, this is also the first sim where you can take control of other crew positions. Uh, if I hit the two key, I go to the co-pilot's control. I look to my right and there's the pilot there looking off somewhere. And I'm now in the co-pilot seat. I can control the uh, control the aircraft from his position. If I hit the three key, the door opens, and I am in the uh, right door gunner seat. As you can see, um, you look around, use the track IR to control a gun, and you can uh, fire using the mouse button or whatever you've configured to your HOTAS. Um, for me, uh, this takes a little getting used to, especially um, when you consider you know, uh, if I see this, I kind of go into first-person shooter mode, and I expect to use my mouse to aim, but I'm using my head to aim, not my mouse. Um, but you do, you can use the mouse to fire. Oh, there's one tough truck. I guess you can also use the mouse to aim too, but it's kind of conflicting with the track IR, as you can see here. So I'm just going to use the head to aim. Likewise, if you hit the four key, you are now in the left door gunner's position. Same deal. I hit one, I'm back to the pilot's position. Uh, the door gunner doors are now opened. I don't quite know how to close them. Actually, let me... Uh, nope, that didn't work. That just closed the pilot's door. Um, but the pilot's door is now closed. That should help with the noise somewhat, but it is going to be a bit of a noisy ride because the doors are open. Okay, let's start the engine. So there's a couple of things that still haven't been implemented in the beta, um, but the engine start sequence is still pretty involved. Um, it's what you would expect from a DCS sim. There's a lot of switchology to it, um, but it's uh, more straightforward than some of the other aircraft. So I'm gonna just take you through it really quickly. Step one, we wanna check all the DC circuit breakers, make sure that they're all in. Uh, they all look good here. Um, these aren't implemented, however, they are in DCS A10, which is really cool, I think, but not here. We don't need the dome light because it's daytime, we'll skip that. Um, now we go to the AC power switches. We want the uh, this switch in AC phase. The switch controls basically what the, um, the AC load indicators indicate. In this case, we want them to, we want to show the AC phase system. Um, and we also want to make sure that the inverter is off, which it is. Okay, we go to the DC power switches now. Um, we want to make sure that uh, the main generator is on and the cover is down. Um, and we want to set this to essential bus. Uh, this is the voltmeter switch. It controls what the voltmeters here, um, what system they display voltage from. In this case, we want to show the essential bus. Um, and then we want to set the non-essential bus, uh, make sure it's at normal on. This will um, automatically turn on the non-essential bus uh, if, there's, um, if there's the ability to power it. Um, the starter gen switch, starter generator should be at start. It is great. And the battery switch should be on. That wonderful warning you hear is the uh, low rotor RPM warning. Um, it's going to go continuously until we spool up the engine and get the rotor RPM up to a normal amount. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn off the audio. Isn't that better? Okay. Let's test the fuel. Or sorry, let's test the fire detect switch. Yep. Great. And um, go to the center pedestal. So avionics equipment should be all off, 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 off. Great. Um, the external storage jettison panel should be safe. It is. The arm switch should be in safe, which is this position here. Um, that's the master arm switch. Um, and the uh, governor switch should be in auto. The ice switch should be off. For fuel, we're going to turn on the main fuel system. You can hear the main fuel pump coming on. 
and we're going to leave the auxiliary fuel pumps off because we don't have auxiliary tanks. Uh, we're going to uh, test the caution lights here. They all work, and then we're going to reset them. And this turns off the master caution. We're going to turn on the hydraulic controls and the force trim switch. Uh, this is the force trim switch here. If you press this button, it works kind of like the central position trimmer uh, in the Ka 50. It basically neutralizes any forces on the control stick to give you a break. Um, and we're going to make sure that the chip detect system is in both. So the chip detect system basically detects metal chips in the oil, um, which is indicative of a degrading part, which is um, shedding, uh, you know, like something's grinding and shedding pieces into the oil. Um, if that happens, the chip detect light here comes on. Um, when that happens, you can momentarily switch the chip detect uh, system to either the transmission or the tail rotor. Um, for whichever light it goes out, the other system is the one with uh, metal chips in it, and it'll need to be checked. Uh, but in normal use, we make sure it's on both. Okay, we're going to check the flight controls now. Great. All flight controls are working, and we are going to turn on the anti-collision light uh, to indicate that we'll be starting the motor soon. Okay, so engine start. So in real life, basically, uh, what you want to do, uh, in real life, what you would do is hold down this button, which would allow you to move the throttle, which is this thing here. Um, it would allow you to move it from the uh, off position to the idle position, and the engine would start. Uh, it's not quite implemented like that um, in DCS. In DCS, basically, holding down this button starts the engine, um, and this thing is only ever in the idle position or in one of the uh, non-idle running positions. So we're going to make sure this is all the way back in the idle position. And we're going to hold down this button. And here's what's going to happen. Once we hold down this button, the engine's going to come online, and you're going to see the gas producer uh, gauge here roll up. This is basically for, um, for jet aircraft pilots. They call this the N1 gauge. It's basically the core engine RPM as a percentage. Um, when we hold this down, this core engine RPM is going to come up. And we're looking for two things. Number one. Uh, at around 15%, we should see the main rotor start turning. And number two, at either 40% or 40 seconds on the clock, um, we need to release the start switch, uh, whichever comes first. So let's, uh, let's get to it. So I'm pressing and holding the system. Gas producer's coming online. It's at 10% now. 15%, we're looking for the rotor to start turning. There it goes. Twenty seconds on the clock. And forty percent. Release the switch and the engine continues to start up on its own. Throttle is still in the full idle position. And as you can see here. The main engine and rotor RPM is coming up. The outer numbers here are the uh, engine RPM, and the inner, inner numbers are the rotor RPM. So, uh, N1 should stabilize between 68 and 70%, which it has. 68 and 72%, sorry. Uh, now that the engine has started, we can turn on the inverter by switching it to main one. Check the engine and transmission oil pressures and temperatures. Engine, and engine oil is in the green. Engine oil pressure and temperatures in the green, and transmission oil uh, pressure is still going to be in the blue. Okay, now we can start the run. So let's turn on our avionics first of all. Uh, we'll turn on the VHF comm radio, the UHF radio, the ADF and the VHF FM. Um, this switch here controls who you're talking to. Uh, let's set it to the two position, uh, which will allow us to communicate over the comm radio to the tower. And now we'll uh, set the starter generator to standby so that it, we, it is ready for emergency to start. Okay, let's check all our systems. Fuel, fuel pressure is good, fuel quantity is good, engine instruments are good, 
transmission instruments are good, and electrical systems. For the AC uh, load, we want to see about 112 to 118 volts. And then the DC load, we want to see about 27 to 28 volts. Okay, now what we're going to do is slowly bring up the throttle until the uh, engine RPM is at 6600. And while we do that, we're going to be monitoring the engine instruments to make sure nothing goes wrong. So I'm slowly rotating the throttle knob now, and as I do so, the engine RPM starts to pick up. It should pick up in a bit here. Okay, as it picks up, I'm monitoring oil pressures and temperatures to make sure nothing spikes. Still bringing the throttle up slowly. And it should stabilize at 6600 RPM. Okay, there we go. 6600 RPM. Transmission, fresh, oil pressure, and temperature are. Okay, all other systems are still good. Avionics are set. We're ready for takeoff. So I'll just briefly go over the controls uh, for you for a bit. The trigger is actually a radio transmit switch. If you press it down part way, you'll transmit over the intercom system so that uh, your co-pilot and gunners can hear you. If you press it down all the way, you'll transmit over the radio through the selected radio here. Um, this switch here, as mentioned before, is the force trip switch. Um, this switch controls the hoist cables on the DCS. This is actually your fire button here. Um, so that'll fire your gun. And this is the hoist release switch, also not in the ECS. On the collective, uh, you can see we have some other switches that control the landing light here. You can retract it and extend it, turn it on and off. You can manually control the governor speed here. It's usually automatic. You can control the searchlight with this hat. Um, and that's about it. And uh, you have the idle stop switch, which starts the engine as we previously talked about. Okay, uh, let's get ready for our hover check. Uh, and I have to warn you, I'm terrible at flying this aircraft. For whatever reason, I just don't have a touch for it. Um, but I'm, we're going to do the best we can here. Um, the key to hovering in the UH-1 is to anticipate the controls that you're going to need before you need them and get, your, uh, get those inputted ready. So um, yeah, there are charts you can use. And if you look up at our current gross weight, um, the correct control position for a hover is stick slightly back into the left and touch a left pedal. Because as you guys know, when you increase the collective, um, torque is going to want to make your aircraft turn to the right, and you need left pedal to counteract that. Uh, in addition, the balance centered position is going to be slightly back into the left. So if we can anticipate that, we can hopefully take off with a, a minimum of um, wobble. But we'll see how we actually do with this. So an increase collective now. I kind of under-anticipated the uh, anti-torque a bit, but we seem to be doing okay now. Not great, not bad. Mostly maintaining the same position. As you can see, I have a lot of trouble doing this while looking stable. This is about as good as it's going to get without some significant practice. So, let's do the pickup now. We just allow the helicopter to pitch forward and increase the collective further. As you can see, the helicopter starts to shudder with um, intensive control inputs. Uh, this is a warning that you um, need to kind of slow things down or mass bumping or other nasties could occur. And we're flying. Okay, so that's the basics of flying it. Now let's learn how to fight with it. And once again, I must emphasize that I'm a beginner and I probably won't get it. So let me force trim out some of these uh, control forces so that I can look down for a bit. I'm going to arm the weapon system. Uh, that force trim did not work at all. Let's recover. Let's try this again. Okay. So, what we want to do first of all is we're going to try out the gun. So we want to make sure that the gun is selected as the current weapon switch. The switch here uh, shows the bottom of the position, which you can't really read. It says 7.62. That refers to the 7.62 millimeter cannons. Uh, the forward-facing cannons, which you can see here, and there's another one. Oh, uh, you can't quite make it out behind the co-pilot. But we're going to be using those cannons. 
so if the weapon system is armed, the cannons are selected and ready to fire. Um, out here in the uh, marsh area, I've got a couple of trucks lined up. You can see them uh, right here. Um, we're going to have some fun. The best way to fire it is using a co-pilot. Now when I switch to the co-pilot position, I can still fly the aircraft. Um, there is an option in the sim to turn on a uh, completely unrealistic autopilot and fly the aircraft for you while you manage the weapon systems. I say it's completely unrealistic because the UH-1 doesn't have an autopilot. Of course, it's also unrealistic that I should be flying this helicopter by myself, so go figure. Um, the co-pilot also allows you to use the flexible gun sight here. So if I hit M, this brings down the flexible gun sight. And this gun sight follows my field of view and I can use it to aim the guns. If we look to the left, you can see that the cannon is tracking where I look. So we look right, we look left, you can see the cannon is following my head position. So I nearly have to look at a target to shoot it. If I look very far to the left or to the right, only one cannon will fire so that the other uh, cannon on the other side uh, doesn't strike the fuselage. However, if I'm looking generally straight ahead and both cannons are uh, able to fire on a target without striking the helicopter, they will. Uh, for me personally, it takes a lot of getting used to looking at a target to shoot it. I, I kind of have this tendency to want to fly the helicopter, to, to uh, fly the pipper onto the target without realizing I can just move my neck and look at it. But let's give this a try. You can see it has an incredible rate of fire. Very good at aiming it. That last shot, as you noticed, uh, only the right cannon fired because it was out of range of the left one. Or I guess I should say out of gimbals. I'm going to come around for another pass. Realistically, of course, I don't know if um, multiplayer support for crew positions is in the works or already done, but. Um, Realistically, this is going to make for some very awesome multiplayer if it isn't that the handle be able to focus on aiming rather than flying and aiming. Okay, I'm not hitting anything, but you get the general idea. The trucks aren't even moving. Okay, let's raise the flexible sight and go back to the pilot's position now. And we're going to try it out with rockets. So to use the rockets, we simply move this switch to the uh, 2.75 position. That, of course, refers to the 2.75 inch holding fin aerial rockets, or FFARs. The FFARs come out of this launcher here and the one on the other side. Those are fixed launchers, so they're not articulated. You can't move them around. You have to aim with the helicopter instead of aiming with the reticle. So to do that, we hit M on the pilot side to bring up this fixed reticle. I don't know how realistic this is, but there you go. And remember, this is a fixed reticle, so uh, like gravity drop, wind corrections, and uh, and inertia corrections, you're going to have to do on your own. You're going to have to kind of eyeball it. But this will give you a general idea of where the rocket should go. Let's see how I am with this. Oh, the other thing we're going to need to do before we fire the rockets is set the salvo size, because it's currently at zero. So we click, right click this once, set the salvo size to one. That says one pair of rockets will be fired every time I pull down the trigger. Uh, the recoil from the rocket launcher can be significant, so one pair is fine for now. Let's come around again. Okay, there are targets. You just fly the tipper onto them and fire. Rockets away. Well, I still haven't hit anything, but as you can see, the trucks are at least scrambling for their lives now. Oh, there we go. I have to hit that guy now. It's also a bad idea to overfly the targets I just hit, because these rockets can set them from shrapnel pretty far. Oh, that sounded like an explosion. Yep, finally got some. Awesome. Okay, for our last demonstration now, we're going to use the door gunners. Um, so I'm going to hit three now to go to the right door gunner. As you can see, I can still fly the helicopter, but of course it's kind of insane to fly it like this, because you're looking one direction and flying the other. Uh, it can get kind of difficult, but nonetheless I'm going to give it a try. So I can come in 
closer. This is a true Vietnam experience here. As you can probably tell, my shots were landing pretty far left of the trigger, sorry, of the uh, sight. Um, the forward motion of the helicopter requires you to impart a significant amount of correction on your aim, so that's something that skilled door gunners will get really good at. lesson in the DCS Huey. Thanks all of you for watching. If you have any questions, just let me know. I'm enjoying this greatly and I hope at some point I'll be able to post real videos um, where I actually have some skill. Until then, Stretch, signing off.